The Gator Tales with Sean Kelly podcast is presented by UF Health. UF Health has locations throughout Florida, including Gainesville, Jacksonville, St. Augustine, Leesburg, and the Villages, and we're growing. Compassionate care and world-class outcomes, that's our game plan. Visit ufhealth.org to learn more. Our podcast also brought to you by Pet Paradise. Hey, Gator fans, for pet fanatics like you, there's only one place who goes all out for your pet the way you do. Boarding, grooming, day camp, and veterinary services all in one convenient location. Pet Paradise and New Day Veterinary Care. Finally, complete pet health care is here for Gator Nation. Hi again, everybody. I'm Sean Kelly, and this is Gator Tales with Sean Kelly. Good morning from my office inside Ben Hill Griffin Stadium. 6.30 a.m. on a Tuesday here at the Swamp. And while it's still dark outside, ROTC is going through marching exercises across the street right now outside of the O'Connell Center, under the lights, of course, on that sidewalk. And later today, it'll be busy around campus. It's that time of year, of course, when seemingly every Gators team is in session, whether it's the off-season preparation like baseball, their fall schedule full underway, but men's and women's basketball now inching ever so close to their openers, and then, of course, all the fall sports in full swing with soccer and volleyball coming up on their final home matches of the year. Campus is buzzing too because it's also Florida Georgia week and we'll all be heading over to Jacksonville a little bit later in the week for the big game on Saturday afternoon. Speaking of big, we've got a big podcast for you today. All three of our interviews I think you'll find to be must listens. We'll start with Florida Gators quarterback Graham Mertz who's having an unbelievable debut season in orange and blue. The transfer from Wisconsin is exceeding expectations and coming off of an engineered fourth quarter drive to beat South Carolina prior to the bye. In this podcast, though, we get Graham Mertz in a different setting. We're going to talk everything from Kansas City barbecue to why he wears the number 15 here for the Florida Gators. On campus this week is ESPN personality Marty Smith. Marty Smith, the writer from Virginia who graduated from Radford, has made an unbelievable career being the everyman for sports fans nationwide and in the SEC. Whether it's radio, television, or print, I should say .com these days, Marty Smith is a dynamic personality, and he is on campus this week working on a feature showcasing the ETN brothers, Travis of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Trevor of the Florida Gators. He and SEC Nation and his radio show, Marty and McGee, will be at Jacksonville for this weekend's football game. And finally, as I mentioned, both basketball teams are gearing up for season openers coming in the first week of November. We'll sit down today with men's basketball coach Todd Golden to get a season preview of a new look Gator squad. Oh, and there's one campus tradition I guess I was unaware of. Of course, it's what to wear on game day. And I'm not talking about coaches and players. Kenna McGinnis, our student worker, is back with Kenna on campus with a tradition that maybe you're not even aware of. So there's a lot to get to. Let's begin with Florida Gators quarterback, Graham Mertz. Graham Mertz and I get to visit every Friday. We do so pregame. It's kind of our thing. Normally, we do not get to talk in this format, which would be a podcast. So you and I have not had the lengthy conversation on tape that we would have today. And and I'm not talking about like an hour, but just a few more minutes than the two minutes we have on Friday. So yes, I'm very much looking forward to that. The first thing I do want to ask you, though, is it struck me, you said, I think to the media maybe a week or two ago, that this is as happy as you've ever been. Was that the statement you made? <laughs> yeah, I think it's uh, I'm, I'm having as much fun as I've ever had, okay. which which leads to being happy. I mean, I think, yeah, I'm having a blast, man. Yeah, and, and so I, I got to thinking about that. I'm like, well, that's kind of a great statement or a heavy statement in some ways. What qualifies the most fun? Because I want to make sure I've got the word right. The most fun you've ever had. What? Qual- okay, that's a yeah. good question. I, th- I think for me, it's... Um, I think I'm just so in the moment every day. The thing I appreciate is, is the people around me um, and just the, really the environment you're in every day. I mean, people, they love this team and we, we love each other. And it, that's one thing where it's kind of hard to 
it's not like you, you're never gonna have a day where you walk and you're like god i'm so angry at everybody like everybody's so mean <laughs> you know what i mean like the, the people that we have around us here are just uh i mean it's awesome so you come in every day and I, mean, I love to do what i do and the people that are here i mean it's it's fantastic to work with them but that's not to say it was awful other places right and so that's that's why i found the statement to be somewhat profound because i was like okay i don't think graham's coming from some awful situation so what's made this one more fun than the other ones that's that was i mean i think i've always had fun playing this game um i think uh for me like i said it's just it's being in the moment like i think sometimes and especially during the season it's easy to kind of have like a broad focus and and days kind of just slowly go by and, and you're not really in the moment but when you're in the moment and uh like I said, it's 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 always for me. It's always been about the people. Like I had great people around me at Wisconsin and, and here. There, I mean, they're awesome. And for me, it's, I mean, the more you play the game, you, you have an appreciation for what what goes into it across the board. And I think that uh, the setup we have here and the people we have is is what makes it so much fun. Okay. Now I now I get it. <laughs> but I had to ask though. I had I had to ask. You've lived in the deep south now for nine months after oh, yeah. after being in the Midwest all your life prior. Um, was there some culture shock? Have you gotten over it a little bit? Oh yeah. I mean, the biggest thing was the biggest thing was the weather. I mean, the humidity was. I was not ready for it, like at all. I mean, it's been awesome. I love Florida. I mean, I have no complaints about. What would you say? Nine months, eight months, nine months. Well, since January, right? So we're nine months in. Yeah. Ten months in. Yeah. I mean, it's been awesome. But the biggest thing was the weather. I had to get had to get used to that. But yeah, I mean, I've, I've, when we had off time, I kind of went o- went on all the way around the state, so I kind of saw everything Florida had to offer, and it was it was awesome. You ever been homesick in your life? I'd say I was more homesick f- freshman year of, co- of college, but once you spend some time, I mean, I see my parents every weekend during the season, so I mean, really cherish the time we had together. But yeah, I love I love to go home uh, and get some barbecue, but got some business we got to take care of <laughs> true it is kansas city barbecue which okay is, which is the best barbecue in the world make your case yep i mean it's across the board i mean you think about sauce you think about the meat you think about the environment atmosphere i mean there's there's nowhere better for barbecue and the, uh, we're really getting some hot takes in here now where okay where where do you no i mean i i i, I am a city absolutely i mean oh, i grew yeah, up in yeah, st louis yeah. so um so louis no because st louis is kind of like this mix between kansas city and memphis it's a combination of the two texas has their style carolina barbecue is carolina barbecue florida georgia type thing i'm just I, that's why i said i wanted to make your case oh, yeah. yeah so is it is it gates all the way or what's what's going to be the quintessential kansas city barbecue then uh there's a i mean joe's i think joe's is you've been there joe's oh yeah yeah oh yeah mm-hmm. little z-man action yeah joe's is joe's is the spot but i mean there's a bunch q39 gates arthur bryant's uh, Jack Stack. I mean, the list goes on. I think that's the the one thing, and they're all unique. Yes, and I and right. like Jack Stack would be probably like near the top of my list. How did we get on this conversation? By the way, you've you're making me hungry. You've yes, you've spent some time with me. I'm sure you've gathered that I've been to just about all the great barbecue spots from <laughs> this body. So, so what's what's your number one then? You said Jack Stack for Kansas City. I think so. Yeah, I need to find some down here. I haven't had a barbecue in a while. That's a whole nother podcast. We'll work on that. So, not really homesick, which is funny because I think getting to know about your family a little bit, both sisters having played ball, dad, you've you've shared with me before that mom is extremely competitive. I get this feeling that if you were homesick in any way, there would be this kind of almost, hey, Graham, suck it up kind of mentality coming from your family. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I've never had a conversation like that, but I could I could imagine that coming from my dad. I mean, he's been he's been awesome in my career. I mean, just just daily communication and like I mean, he's my best friend, and he, he always shoots me straight, no, no matter what's going on or how I'm feeling. I mean, he tells me the truth, and that's one thing I I truly appreciate in my relationship with him is that he's just nothing but the truth. <laughs> he's never going to sugarcoat anything, and it might not be what you want to hear. I mean, but he's going to tell you. When did you first refer to your dad as your best friend? Um, really my whole life. I mean, I think I think my entire family, really. I mean, I think that I got, I'm blessed to have such a close family that is always there. We, I mean, we talk every day. We have group chat. We're talking 24-7 in the group chat. But, uh, yeah, I mean, my I didn't grow up with a brother. So, for me, we always had, my sisters were always, we had a little age gap, so they were really close. But my dad and I were always we were always with each other whether it was playing video games or 
yeah, we played. We, I don't know why that popped in my head. We used to play Madden all the time together. But uh, yeah, he's always been my family's. They're they're, they're all my best friends. But, Sounds great. Yeah. Sounds also like there's never a moment when you all are not competing at something, though. Oh no, we we can't sit down and play. I mean, we used to play. What was it sorry the board game and they would end up and just screaming <laughs> so we're we're like we're uber competitive i think my mom's my mom probably takes the cake as number one as most competitive um but i mean across the board we got it's a competitive group <laughs> you and rick pearsall are like brothers now um are you two competing all the time or is that the one person you can be around that maybe we don't have to compete every minute that we're together i, I think the big thing with him is that uh, we really just like hold each other accountable i think any time that um like there's never a day where i wake up and i'm like god i don't want to do anything today but i feel like if there was a day like that he'd yeah. be he'd be the one to be like hey dude <laughs> come in <laughs> you know what i mean but um i think just our like we each have our own love for the game um and we, we really just wake up every day and like honor that and respect it for each other and i think we we love playing the game with each other and then everybody on this team so I mean, I think that if there was a day where I woke up and felt like that, he'd be the one to call me and, and get me up. I, I don't see that day coming. But You're wearing a number now at Florida that has been worn by ultimate competitors before. Now, obviously, Tim Tebow comes to mind. Heck, Anthony Richardson wore it last year for the Gators. Um, whether or not we're going to have a conversation about numbers being retired at the college level, what made you want to wear 15 here in orange and blue? Yeah, I think uh, the big thing was – <laughs> coach gave it to me <laughs> uh i came i wore number five and i opened up my locker and saw it in there one day so i wore number five wisconsin and then when i came down here i saw it so the big thing for me was uh what i appreciated is it was a it was a fresh start for me and it was a, a deeper meaning of understanding who wore it before me and realizing that i got on i get to honor that every day i don't i don't have to honor that so for me it was uh I, mean, I wake up every day knowing what's come before me and, and you got to honor that in, in everything you do and i mean you think back to the history of this place just in general and knowing everybody that has came like and what has happened here before you i mean that fires me up every day yeah you have a chance to keep playing college football after the season if you'd like to do you love the college game so much that that's not even a question or now after what will be 40 some games yeah. by the end of the season do you will you have a conversation you think about that very thing yeah i mean i think i think when the time comes um will definitely be conversations about it um i think right now i'm so invested in, in each day that uh that's not really my focus and my focus is really just being the best for this team and winning football games so i think there will definitely be a day where that's a conversation that has to be had i figured that'd be your answer which leads me to the question that i actually wanted to ask you because you've played in the big 10 and now the sec what is it about college football that makes it so great oh gosh there's so much I, like i said like honestly like i said about earlier about the people in this building i think it's I, I think it's the people. I think the people make it what it is. I mean, I think there's so much history, so much passion in each fan base, each team. I mean, it's it's a beautiful thing, man. I think I think it teaches it teaches you life lessons along the way that only this sport can teach you. So, I mean, I'm forever thankful for it. I mean, it's taught me just so many different things about me, about people, about relationships, about team environments. I mean, it's it's been a fantastic thing for me what motivates you still at this point after so many games played i'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going with this one i'm gonna say i'm gonna say the people <laughs> we're on that theme of people so is it specific people who what's the motivator yeah it's really it's it's being the best for each guy on on this team i mean i've, I've been on teams where i've been i've been in games where you, you lose games and if it affects people guys are they're crying i mean I've, I've seen i've seen everything this game offers whether that's good bad or ugly so i mean i think it's it's striving for for what everybody wants and that's to win and how that affects people and really i'd, I'd say my my why is, is my family i mean my sisters didn't, they didn't they didn't get to finish their college careers in basketball with injuries so um they're, they're another reason why I honor this game every day and, and I try to um, keep myself healthy and, and just enjoy what I'm doing. 
Graham, there's going to be somebody out there who listens to this visit or other ones you've done the media, and they're going to say every answer he gives is the perfect answer. It's almost like it's scripted or rehearsed. But yet, I've known you now enough to know that's you genuinely. Does that strike you as weird that people would think that? Uh, no. I mean, I think I think just spending so much time in college, you, uh, you see all the narratives, all the stories. Um, and sometimes you'd be like, look, I'm just like, I'm just me. <laughs> like, and when you, when you don't force it and you just be who you are, I mean, I think that frees you up to really to, to be who you are in everything you do. And that's where, like I said, I'm having so much fun. And that's just cause I feel like I'm in a spot where it's just allowing me to be my natural self every day and, and how I interact with people. Um, so yeah, I'm having so much fun just, just being myself. Last thing is this. Uh, I had the uh, privilege uh, to cover Drew Brees for a number of years. Drew had very much a process in his way. One thing he would do is he would literally go into the indoor facility and he would rehearse or walk through or visualize how the game the next day would go all by himself in the building. I've seen the video. Yes, you've seen the video I'm talking about. So what's the weirdest thing that you do? During a game week, oh, weirdest thing I do during a, a game week. Um, I think one. Th- I'm pretty. I'm pretty normal in my approach. I think it's uh, well, not, probably not normal, but I mean, obviously you have film. Um, but one thing I do that I've added to my uh, to my week of prep since I came down here was really just drawn out and getting a feel for. Like you turn on tape of the other team and you're watching tape, you're taking notes. But for me, it's like each day taking what 24, 12 different plays from each game and truly drawing out what guys' responsibilities are, what they're doing based on what the other offense is doing. So um, it takes a little bit of time, but it, it's a lot of drawing. <laughs> but uh, for me, that's one thing that's kind of it's been awesome for me because you learn what guys' responsibilities are based on different whether it's uh, formations. I'm nerding out right now, but how motions dictate their coverages and stuff like that. So for me, it's, I wouldn't say that's weird. That's just normal prep, but I don't really have anything that's wild or weird. I think my biggest thing is I'm, I'm not superstitious, but I'm, I, everything has to be a certain way, whether that's what I'm wearing during practice, um, how my cleats are spatted, um, so I, I like my stuff the way I like my stuff. <laughs> Very organized in my in my approach with that. You're particular. Yeah, that's the word. We'll oh yeah, yeah. Particular. Same thing with like my apartment. I mean, everything needs to be tidy. Oh yeah, keep it neat. The bed gets made every day. Yeah. Oh yeah. I had no idea we'd talk about your bed being made or not. <laughs> Barbecue spots in Kansas City, but this is why I enjoyed our visit. So thank you and. Um, I'll see you on Friday morning for the part of our process. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, the Gator's Tales podcast is pleased to have Mr. Marty Smith. And if I may, just for a moment, can I revel in the fact that here are two ESPN guys talking to each other on tape, neither of which went to Syracuse University? Yeah, not only did I not go to Syracuse University, I didn't go to a Power Five. I went to Radford University, uh, about which I am very proud. And I was actually just there uh, this past weekend. I was given an award for being some sort of accomplished alumni. And I I was speaking to the assemblage, and it's funny how, like, I just want young people especially who – don't go to Florida or Alabama or Tennessee or Syracuse or Missouri or these great J schools that you can do whatever you want to do with as long as you work harder than everybody else and you're more passionate. And I was grateful, so grateful to receive that award, first of all, but to be able to take a moment and share that with the assemblage also matters to me deeply. While we're on the topic of school, um, I'm curious with regard to your interviewing skills, which of those did you learn in school, and which are the ones that you learned outside of school? Uh, honestly, all of them were outside of school because I think it's 
one of those things that comes with repetition. It's one of those skill sets that comes with learning to close your mouth and open your ears. For the vast majority of my career, I tried to drive interviews in certain directions that I wanted them to go rather than letting the individual I'm interviewing share their truth and then following up. But about 10 years ago, a friend of mine, well, Dale Earnhardt Jr., the NASCAR driver, I did an interview with another NASCAR driver, Jeff Gordon, and I really drove that interview in certain directions and in in certain instances actually cut Jeff off. And the interview ran on the pre-race show on ESPN, and I was very proud of it, and I got a lot of affirmation for it and filled up my insecurities. And then after the race, Dale Jr. pulled me aside, and he's like, you need to shut up. I was like, what? He's like, dude, there were some things I wanted to hear Jeff say in that interview you did, and you cut him off, and it was rude, and you know it. You need to shut up and let people finish. And I was only angry because I knew he was right. And that moment changed my entire operational approach to interviewing people now it's ask open-ended questions that let them share their truth and everything changed for me at that point so I would say all of it is from my professional life do you interview college athletes and pro athletes differently I do not the one thing that you try to do is you try to reach them on their level no matter what that level is because that makes them more comfortable and I think that's any relationship, not just interviewing people. Like, I just got done with, with Trevor ETN here right before you and I chatted. What a wonderful spirit. And when you're interviewing someone like him who's so accomplished in his own right, but he's constantly walking in this shadow because his brother is so talented and has had such an accomplished career, both at the collegiate and professional levels, you want to make sure that you're asking those questions in a fair way that is respectful to him because he does want to be his own person and you don't just you don't just snap your fingers and have that ability that comes with time as you said you're here to interview Trevor you'll interview Travis here this week for a feature coming up on SEC Nation Marty I'm curious what what did you hope or what do you hope to learn from the ETN brothers collectively it's a unique relationship because you know 5 years between them so kind of coming into this my perspective on it was there's no way that that little brother didn't you know have his blankie following big brother around and then there's no way that he even said it in our interview Trevor did he remembers playing football under the stands in high school and hearing his brother's name six seven times because he scored that many touchdowns I mean it was one of the most accomplished high school careers in the history of the state of Louisiana and that's exactly what I expected him to say And so that's kind of what we want from this is this very rare bond. And not only is it a rare bond, but between two individuals who want to be individuals while playing the exact same position in the exact same sport. So there's going to be comparison for the rest of their lives. And their mother also is a dynamo. We interviewed her yesterday in Jacksonville and her vulnerability and honesty in the environment in which those two young men grew up and her complete conviction to make sure that she kept them on the straight and narrow focused on their academics and focused on their athletics stopped time for me I really sat back in my seat because she is no bs buddy Mm -hmm. you're not kidding about that (laughs) it's interesting you said that you expected him to respond in a certain way Sometimes I probably catch myself interviewing somebody going for the expected. And it's when it's the unexpected that comes out that makes for the best visit. Can you think of the best unexpected you've gotten over the years? The best unexpected I've gotten? I I would say probably, maybe not actually during the interview, but one of the most unexpected moments I've had. I went down to Medalist Golf Club a few years ago to interview Tiger Woods and I had not met Tiger Woods at the time and I was sitting in the lobby of Medalist Golf Club and I was preparing myself kind of final preparations for this interview and 
this shadow washes across the doorway and I look up and it's Tiger Woods and you're like whoa so I stood up to shake his hand and introduce myself and he's like nah bro bring it in so he gives me this big hug and I was like hmm. he goes you want to know the coolest thing I've ever seen on ESPN and I said what he said last year in Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s last NASCAR race, when you shotgunned a beer with him live on Sports Center, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. And I thought immediately, okay, I didn't expect that, but you and me are going to get along just fine if that's how you operate. You go win Augusta National again, I'll be waiting on, on you at 18 with a cold beer. And literally the next year, he won the Masters again and, and with, in one of the greatest comeback stories in the history of sports. So – I did not expect Tiger Woods to hug me and say he likes to chug beer. Did you chug beer with Tiger Woods after that Masters? I have not, no. After I did, it was funny because I was in this little room at Augusta, and he was in kind of the where they put the champion and the champion's family before they bring them out for the media assemblage in the media room. And I was peeking around the corner in there because I really wanted like to see if they had any beer in there. And he was in there, and he just looked at me with that trademark grin and winked. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is my chance to chug this beer. But I did – it's Augusta. Like, I didn't know what to do. I short-circuited. Oh, no. There'll be another opportunity, I have a feeling. He's amazing, dude. I mean, he he has been wonderful to me. And he not only has been wonderful to me when he – well, he's been wonderful to me when he didn't have to be. And, I mean, times when he was in tremendous pain – he still did the interview. Times when he didn't have time, he still did the interview. Consummate professional. That speaks to you, though, Marty, doesn't it? I don't know, man. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm, I, I love you. I'm not. I'm not gonna. I just. I, I, I. He. One thing about him, and a lot of athletes are this way, but not a lot of athletes are Tiger Woods. They. They appreciate when you respect their time with great preparation. And if you respect their time with great preparation, they're going to reciprocate that time with great answers. And like I think about Coach Saban, people ask me all the time, oh, how, does, how come he, you know, you, how, how did you get him? I'm con- I, I, I demand preparation and he reciprocates that. If I show up unprepared, he's, that's what he's going to give me back. You know what I mean? And so I, I guess it's just. I'm grateful that I built a good relationship with Tiger and with Coach Saban. Co- uh, Greg Popovich the same way. At least that's what my experience has been. I've not. I've never interviewed Pop. I really wanted to at the NBA draft this year, but he was a little busy uh, drafting Victor Wembanyama. That's a whole other podcast right there. <laughs> Marty, this will be my second Florida-Georgia game in Jacksonville. Can you compare that scene, and I use the word scene, to anything else that you've been around in, in sports? Scene is a very fair – way to say it um going out there in that rv deal is I, a couple years ago my brother-in-law came down and my oldest friend my since i was three years old came over he lived at he was a tampa bay race trainer at the time my brother-in-law came down from new jersey i'd never experienced it and we walked out there and it was awesome i mean fans on both sides uh offering us cold beers uh all kinds of you know they're all of them are smoking meat which is awesome and it was just a great scene. But the game itself means so much to so many. And I love the way that they split the stadium. And it's just one of those – like college football is different. You know this. There's not any other sport like this one. And it rarely are there more beautiful scenes than that one. But, they, they, I mean, there are some that I would say are comparable, but that one is elite. And I don't care – forget records – and all that. It's awesome no matter what the scenario is. When both teams are good now, it's as good as it gets. I can't let you go without asking about the new book, Sideline CEOs. For a guy like me who will never be a head coach or a CEO, what will I learn from reading that book? A lot. The way I did it, and I'm so grateful to the 20 individuals that gave me their time in that book. For those of you listening who – don't know what it is. I interviewed 20 championship coaches, Coach Saban, Dabo Sweeney, Mac Brown, Roy Williams, John Calipari, Tom Izzo, Doc Rivers, Kim Mulkey down at LSU, just won her fourth national title, Patty Gasso 
at Oklahoma, just won her seventh in, in women's softball. On and on. It's truly a who's who about leadership in general, but also sort of these pillars that make great leaders like trust, culture, communication and listening, delegation, self-evaluation, crisis management, evolution. And there is – it's not a sports book. It is a life book in a lot of ways. I've taken a lot of this tutelage – and injected it into my daily walk as a husband and father. And we see these individuals all the time in this press conference, clinical, a lot of times vanilla type of energy. Or we see them on the sideline pissed off, throwing headsets, demonstrative type of energy. We don't get vulnerability a lot. And I'm grateful that that's what I got from all of them. And it's cool. Like, you don't know when you put that kind of – project out into the world you don't know what's coming and I had great fear as I made my way through it oh man is this repetitive what's cool about it is it's 20 completely different personalities so each of them take this wisdom and issue it in completely different ways that is relatable to individuals who read it like uh, so many people have given me the feedback oh I really relate to Tom Izzo or I relate to this person or that person Mac Brown So it's been very fulfilling. And the feedback from people who are CEOs, and I mean we're talking big boy pants companies, is what's really blown my mind. My agent called me a couple days ago, and the CEO of one of the biggest corporations in this country just called them and asked for 25 copies, which they're shipping to my house, to be personally signed. So humbling doesn't even start. I'm grateful beyond words. How did a young man from Virginia who went to Rhett, you know where I'm going with this, right? I have no idea. And I don't, I don't, I used to spend a lot of time asking that question, but I think that, I think living your life in such a way that you lead with kindness and you prove your effort and your energy is undeniable every day. I think it becomes an obligation, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. And I've been given much, but I've also, I've never forsaken those blessings. I'm so grateful for them. And so I don't know why. And I'm so grateful that I was given this platform because ESPN is a platform. It is not my purpose. I'm grateful for it every day, but it's not my purpose, man. And so I think that platform is so much bigger than just the sports part or that. Like It is meeting Trevor Etienne and being someone that obviously respects him and his time and his story and his path and his passions. That's what I want him to take away from that. And that's kind of where I am in this and grateful for it. I could do this for hours, but there are two problems. One, we don't have any cold beer. <laughs> and number two, you're busy. But I appreciate you very much. No, I'm, I'm grateful for the platform, brother. Thank you so much. I love your spirit. I love your work. And, um, you know, we are, we are as people, especially guys like you and me, we've been afforded these platforms where we have the opportunity to impact other lives. And we, if we don't do that, we're failing. And so I'm grateful that you gave me the platform to at least um, – disseminate those messages. So thank you. I'm Kenna McGinnis, and it's time for Kenna on Campus. With as much effort that goes into dressing the team for Gators football season, you'll be surprised to hear just how much effort students put into planning their game day outfits. While many guys are able to grab the cleanest pair of shorts and a jersey off their floor the morning of a game, others meticulously coordinate their attire far in advance. I was able to speak with Isabella, Jordan, and Avery on Sorority Row to speak of timelines, spreadsheets, and more. Isabella, you plan your outfits how early in advance for the Gators football season? I'd say in July, I get a PowerPoint going, I look at the game day schedule, and I have screenshots of, it's a little crazy, but of every single outfit I plan on wearing. Jordan, how about you? Yeah, pretty much the same for me. I don't make a PowerPoint, but I do go through starting um, in the summer, finding things that are on sale or maybe fit my style that will be in blue, orange, or white for the season. All right, and Avery? 
Yeah, well, I have um, like planned out outfits before and bought stuff early. I usually just go into my roommate's closets and see what they're not wearing for the week, and then I'll just try it on and wear it for that day. All right, cool. And I'm guessing since you all live together, game day morning is a little bit hectic trying to get everybody's outfits together if you all share clothes. Yeah, it's actually really fun, though. We're all like running around each other's rooms, trying stuff on, see what look good, looks good, and it's really exciting. Why would you guys say that it's important to look good and feel good in your tailgate outfits and with this outfit planning tradition? Um, I think it's important, just, you know, school spirit. I love to bring that energy into the swamp, and the outfit really makes part of it. Yeah, honestly, I think it's just part of the excitement of game day is just looking forward to um, dressing up and like hanging out with your friends and like getting out and seeing like, the tailgates and the game. Uh, it really brings the energy up. Thank you guys so much for your energy on game days. Thanks to your uh, outfit traditions. Thank you guys and go Gators. Go Gators. Go Gators. Last up is Gators men's basketball coach Todd Golden. Golden is now in his second year as the head coach of the Gators men's basketball team. The team is deep into training camp. We recently sat down for a preseason visit to preview the season. I started our conversation by asking Golden about what he took from year one of his program into this, his second year. Yeah, no, obviously, uh, it, for on a great year to build off of, uh, obviously not making the tournament was disappointing, uh, but a lot of good takeaways, you know, and I think uh, one of the learning lessons is you got to have great depth in this league. You got to have a good second line as well, and obviously ran into some trouble once Colin got hurt, uh, but we're really excited to be able to bring back Riley Will as a building block for this team moving forward. Do you feel like you were able to lay a foundation to get your culture in place and start building off of that? Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we didn't return a lot, but we returned important ones. You know, and I highlight Riley and Will again. Obviously, Alex and Denzel being other guys that returned. And then being able to bring our whole staff back was really important. And I feel like, you know, when you come into a new program, uh, teaching everybody the way you operate is really important. And now I feel like the guys that weren't with us at San Francisco have a really good understanding of how we operate. So uh, we're really excited for this year, too. Let's expand more on the staff for a minute. Just the importance of continuity in your staff, especially early in a program, where does it start to pay off? What are the dividends from that? I, I think it's very similar to the continuity you see when you have guys returning on the floor, right? You, they get to know each other a little better. Uh, they start, you know, having a better feel for how to help each other out and how to complement each other better. And, uh, you know, so going into year two, now we have a staff that understands the language we like to speak on the floor. Uh, now we have a staff that knows how important scouting is to us and preparing and game planning and all these different things. And uh, so I expect a big jump in terms of our production and continuity uh, working together this Year. Todd Golden and his staff virtually remade the majority of the roster here for year two. But, Coach, you did mention the returning guys. That conversation probably starts with Riley Kugel and Will Richard. Talk about their growth, if you don't mind, in your program of what players they were like last year and now how they're showing here in the fall. Yeah, you know, I, I think Riley and Will equally bring a ton of value back for us. You know, both guys, uh, Will was a sophomore, but really his first year of high major basketball, transferring from Belmont. Riley was a freshman last year, so obviously they both had some moments of growing pains, but when you look at their production at the end of the year, you see two guys that performed at a very, very high level in the SEC. And uh, when you're able to return two guys like that, and same for our staff, you get a great understanding of what this league's about and different ways to attack it moving forward. Uh, we expect both those guys have a really big year, as well as being a great connection between our staff and the new players in our program. When Colin Castleton went down with the injury late last season, Riley Kugel's numbers went up. You leaned on him more. Are you looking for that same kind of role and production from him this year too? You know, it was uh, it was really interesting because before Colin got hurt, you know, Riley was really starting to come on as well, and that's why we were able to get off to a six and three start in the SEC. Uh, you know, what he was able to do after Colin's injury, I think, uh, was incredibly impressive, you know, especially for a freshman to go and average about 20 points a game over 10, 10 games uh, down the stretch of the season. Uh, my hope is that he'll have a little more help this year with the other guys so he won't have to be as productive. Uh, we're looking for him to maintain his efficiency as well as get other guys involved. And when you talk about some of these new guys, whether it be Tyree Samuel, Walter Clayton, just to name a few, I think those guys will be able to take off a little bit of that load that Riley had to carry down the stretch for us last year. Another key returner, Denzel Aberdeen. Coach, I, I, I almost didn't recognize him when I got to practice here a couple of weeks ago his body has changed his confidence seems to be different you know a big part of our program uh, we talk about the continuity being able to bring guys back 
Denzel is a guy that you know was a great, a good freshman. wasn't really able to help us win games uh, in the SEC, but a guy that we knew if he stuck with the plan and, and maintained his status in the program, coming back, working in the summer, that he would take a big jump going into that sophomore year. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. A guy that had a great summer, uh, kept his head down, worked his tail off. As you mentioned, his body has gotten uh, in great shape. His athleticism has really gone up another notch. He's jumping really, really well. He's explosive as he gets in the paint off his penetration. And a guy that's going to play real minutes for us this year, and I expect him to do really well. Coach, let's dig into the newcomers, and there are a lot of them. Help me understand what you've done with your roster here and why it all makes sense now. You know, after, again, talking about what we learned from year one, uh, we, we realized these four guys that we brought back were great pieces that we could build with and guys that, uh, for lack of a better term, were our kind of guys, guys that had great work ethics, uh, great attitudes, most importantly, guys that wanted to be Florida Gators. And so now going out and we have nine other scholarships to fill, uh, it, it, was, it was a heavy burden, but we feel great about these different guys that we brought in, six transfers, three freshmen, and most importantly, all guys that uh, really fit into our program, both from a style of play standpoint and from a cultural standpoint. You have a point guard. Walter Clayton comes from Iona, coach. He's taken control of the floor here early. Yeah, he's uh, just a, a really, really talented player. You know, he, when you ask what type of player he is, can you play the point? Absolutely. Can you play the shooting guard position? Absolutely. An explosive score. Uh, reminiscent a little bit of Wade Taylor uh, from Texas A&M. That's a guy I would compare him to that can come in and get baskets and you have to be account for him uh, wherever he is on the floor. And, and as you mentioned, has some really good playmaking ability as well to get his other teammates involved. What about the bigs, coach? How do they look? Really happy uh, bringing in Tyree Samuel from Seton Hall. Obviously a, a double figure scorer in the Big East, a fifth year senior, a guy that's going to be able to come in with a lot of experience. He's had big matchups, played UConn twice last year. So the SEC is not going to be something that he's afraid of. And I expect him to be an impact player from the start. And then Micah Han Lockton, our other front court transfers, 7-1, uh, one of the best shot blockers and rebounders in the country as a freshman. Uh, you know, we'll take them a little bit to adjust to the physicality of the SEC, but I think his production is going to be really, really present from day one, especially on the defensive end. You know, another guy that's caught my eye here recently, Coach, is Thomas Houck, and uh, there's a long way to go in his development, but I can't take my eyes off of him at times because he seems to be all over the floor. Yeah, he, he's a, a great freshman. You know, a, a little on the older side, he's 20 years old, so he, he's a little older than the normal freshman, which I think gives him a head start against some of these other guys. Uh, but just his ability to kind of do it all, he can play the three and the four, can stretch the floor, can really attack the rim, great in transition, really can run, uh, and then a really good team defender as well. And uh, kind of his stepbrother, Alex Condon, the other freshman in the front court, 6'11", 230. Uh, both these guys are going to play for us. Both of these guys can impact winning, and they have a great understanding of how to play the game. I know it's early, Coach, uh, but are there – two or three strengths that you've seen develop with this team that will serve you well this season? Yeah, I think the first thing uh, that's kind of a breath of fresh air is the level of competitiveness. You know, every guy in our program uh, competes with a chip on their shoulder. Uh, you've been at practice. You've seen more guys on the floor already this year than we saw all of last year. And I think that's something that's going to be really key for us. And then obviously the athleticism, the size, uh, and our ability to score the basketball should be better. You know, those are the areas that I think we'll see a good uptick this year. As we mentioned, the schedule begins the first week of November, uh, and it's not an easy schedule. Of course, there's the regular SEC slate coach that you'll go for. That is in conjunction with a non-conference schedule that's challenging, to say the least. To say the least. Now, keep in mind, last year we had an incredibly challenging non-conference as well. So even though it's very difficult, it is toned back a little bit. But we still get a lot of those marquee games that are really important to us to prepare us for SEC play. you got Virginia. Second game of the season in Charlotte. It's a great neutral site game that will have that tournament feel to it. Uh, obviously, we go back to the Jumpman where we're playing Michigan this year, another game that I anticipate uh, against a tournament team. And then we got the preseason IT of Barclays where we're teeing up against Pitt, who made the tournament last year. If we're fortunate enough to beat them, we'll probably end up playing Baylor. Uh, those are just a few. Obviously, the uh, SEC, ACC Challenge going over to Wake Forest. So as I mentioned, them, there are quite a few tough games ahead of us, uh, but it'll prepare us well for SEC play. It, it sounds as daunting as last year. I know that you tried <laughs> to soft play it just a little bit. Last year, Coach, that non-conference schedule was an opportunity for you to A, learn who you had yeah. and see how they'd respond to your teaching and coaching. Is the process in the non-conference a little more accelerated because it's year two? Yeah, absolutely. And again, like I think this, this team is a little further ahead than we were last year. Uh, we didn't really get a summer that first year. We had a lot of injuries. We didn't uh, have our full team put together. Whereas this year, we've been rocking and rolling pretty good since June. So I think this team's going to be a little bit ahead in terms of the start of the season. And uh, we get two good scrimmages before the year starts. And I, I think this team will be 
uh, further along, especially in November, than we were last year. Let's wrap up with this. Do you have a message for your team here during training camp and the start of the season? Is there a theme that you've kind of started to really push with them that you want them collectively on the same page with? Yeah, I think a huge key for this group is just being unselfish and, and kind of putting the team first. And with all these new pieces at times, that can be tough to do. Uh, and, you know, building trust amongst the team is really, really important as we get into it. Uh, but we've made some big strides that way already, and they're already see, seeing the positives of, uh, you know, playing off of each other and, and sharing the rock really, really well. So I, I think if this team can continue to grow in that area, uh, I'm pretty excited to see where we can go. Well, that's it. I got you three headliners here on episode number nine. Thanks so much to Graham Mertz, Marty Smith, Todd Golden, and Kenna McGinnis, too. And special thanks to our sponsors as well, UF Health and Pet Paradise. This one was a special one. And I look forward to episode number 10. That means we'll do this again in this format next week. Until then, I'm Sean Kelly. So long for just a while, and go Gators.